Hi, I'm Murray Feldman and welcome to Easy Money, a special When I'm 65 presentation. This program is about solving your financial problems and the problems that millions of Americans face every single day when it comes to saving and retirement. Here we'll offer you gloss-free explanations that apply to people from any generation. In this episode, we cover the basics of your finances. And joining me is our very special guest, your money. Remember those things that you dreamed about when you were all grown up? Well, this money says you are all grown up. And this isn't just money, it's a ticket to another world of your dreams, the future. Making those dreams come true when you're 65 requires not spending but saving, something that's frankly not fun, at least now. But even if you're grown up, you can still have dreams and you can make them come true. Join me and our three guest experts as we show you how to save yourself. Let's talk about saving. Saving is an art, and it's one that you have to master. It's not fun, but it can be easy if you have the right advice. I'm joined by Susan Tompour, a financial columnist for the Detroit Free Press. Susan, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Murray. What a topic we're talking about. You know, so many people have absolutely no idea where to start when it comes to things like piling up bills and kids and student loans. It can be hard to set aside money for all of these causes, let alone just one of them. But luckily, you've seen a range of advice and a range of knowledge over your years of broadcasting and also in the newspaper. And you see people manage their money and mismanage their money a lot. Oh, absolutely. I think people get scared. You know, you have the economy going against you sometimes, uh, younger consumers starting out, not getting a good job. There's a lot of things that go against you, but you can always correct. There's always the self-correct uh, where you learn a little bit, get a little more education and uh, change, change the game plan if you need to. And it's always important to keep asking questions. We have our first question today from Brenna. She wants to know where do you begin and where do you end? I'm trying to save money, but I have a habit of buying things I don't really need. I find myself going out to eat with friends or going to the mall and just buying things that I don't really need. Um, how can I stay balanced between what I need and what I want? I have to give her credit. She knows the difference between wanting and needing. But she also has another problem. She has a problem many are struggling with and that's trying to keep up with the Joneses. So how do you help people who are having that issue? Well, I think the first thing you have to admit is she's not alone, right? <laughs> Plenty of us are buying stuff we don't need. And I think it gets to be a rut. It gets to be a habit. Um, so one of the first things I think you can do is just take a step back, take a deep breath, stop blaming, you know, and look at maybe what you've bought already, what you've spent money on as, as things, uh, uh, you know, accumulate. Go into that closet count the shoes, count the jeans, you know, count the baseball caps. And if it, you have a spending habit on one thing, put a cap on it, put a lid on it. You can always, you know, delay that spending two weeks or two years so and you can just come back. And just because somebody else has it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing for you. Right. And I think with the Facebook and with the social media, you know, you're always seeing somebody eating out somewhere. You're always seeing somebody testing a new craft beer. Um, you, there's a lot more pressure than there used to be to uh, try something new and have more fun. But you don't always have to have fun. You could, you know, or spend money to have fun. You don't have to spend money to have fun, and, and you have to really see where your money's going and keep a budget and know how much is falling through the fingers every right. single day. I think the one good way to start is how much do you need to live on? You know, maybe just start looking at those numbers and then decide how much discretionary income do you really have? Because you certainly don't have as much as you think. No. And if you start, say, uh, putting aside 10% uh, for your retirement or uh, looking at your student loan bills as a set expense, you know, if I'm going to put add $100 extra a month on that student loan bill, then you realize you don't have as much discretionary income as you think you do once you start saving for the future right. or paying down past debt. So many questions about money management. That's excellent advice, Susan. But now we have another question from a gentleman who really isn't sure how he can achieve his goals while he's still trying to set money aside for his future. It's Zach. I'm thinking about going back to school to get my master's degree and I'm trying to save for retirement, how do I balance splitting my money between both of those? Now here's a guy who's investing in himself, doing the right things. He's looking at himself now, trying to increase the value of, his, his, of himself as an employee. 
and going back to school, and he's looking at the future, too. So, Susan, a lot of us have these goals, things we would like to do in life before we retire, but splitting up the money the right way can sometimes be very difficult. Well, and sometimes I say take a step back and look at the goal. You know, he says he wants to get a master's degree, but the first question I have is how much debt do you already have? How much student loan debt are you already paying off? If you're able to pay down that, uh, what you had for the undergrad in 10 years, then you're in a safe position. But if you already have too much uh, student loan debt, do you need to add more if it, when it comes to that master's degree? So are you going to borrow? And what kind of uh, salary could you get? You know, is this really going to boost your income? Because sometimes some master's degrees don't. I mean, that's, let's be frank, some will take you, you know, to new levels. Uh, in the technology field, you might be able to add a 50000 or 60000 to that salary, depending on where you're at with a master's degree and what you studied. But in other fields, you might not add much. So look at that first. And then, is he, one thing I wondered, is he going to quit his job? Because that's you know, if you lose an income mm -hmm. to go back to school, that's another issue. Um, but saving for retirement, you probably like that Roth IRA because that does give you some flexibility. If you're working at a company that has the Roth 401k, that might give you a little more flexibility too, as if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to be going back to school. You just touched on something that so many of us don't think about, Susan, and that's how much am I going to get out of this? If the education costs this much, what does it pay when I get out in the field? Now, there are a lot of people today who will tell you, you know, I can't make, I've got this degree and nobody wants to hire me. Well, many, maybe the degree is in something that's not really lucrative right now, but people need to realize that early on. Right. Uh, one good website is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It actually has an occupational outlook site and you can plug in some uh, income, uh, plug in some degrees that you might be interested in, plug in some different jobs and you'll get a general range of what you might get in that job. Uh, somebody like in acting, they don't have a salary for that because of course, who knows what you could get there, right? But in some of these tech degrees, some of these engineering degrees, they'll give you a good idea. And uh, I think that does help to just sort of Figure out, well, what is real? What might I really get? Great example there, and it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS. Just search them out, and it'll take you right there to that site because they've got so much information there. Let's move on to another question from a young woman who's facing a problem that is really um, all too common for so many people, saving for a home. I'm currently renting in an apartment, and I'd like to buy a house soon. How can I save for buying a house and also start a family? All right, Susan, what do you tell somebody like that? Is it possible to save enough to buy a home while at the same time you're also trying to start a family? Yeah, I think it is. It depends on that job. Right now, a lot of millennials are very lucky because the job market is better and they are starting to see some of these wage gains. Uh, so depending on what field you're in, you may be doing you know, a little bit better than a few years ago when a lot of people were stringing together jobs in a gig economy. So depending on how you're uh, settling down with your work, with your career, you may easily be able to say, set, save enough for a house. The key is, do you want to put down 20%? Because if you want to put down 20% on a $200,000 house, that's $40,000. And some people can't quite do that. But many people, on average, will put down 6% or 10%. There are some programs where you can put down 3 and 5 So you have to look at you know, what's available. I think the best thing to do is shop for the mortgage first before you shop for the house. See where you are financially and then you can get an idea. That is so important because different lenders have different qualifications and different regulations that they have to deal with. So you may not qualify at one or get a good deal at one, but another one may be looking for somebody who might be just like you. You might be the person they're looking for, the person they're targeting. Exactly. And, and so you want to do some shopping around on that mortgage early on. And we run some numbers. There are calculators online. Bankrate.com has how much I can afford, you know, for a home. You might want to research that first before you go out and look at that home. Because we all know when you fall in love with the kitchen or you fall in love with the garage, you're buying it. You know, if you can get the money or get mom and dad to get you the money or somebody to get you the money. And if you're thinking about buying a home in the next year, start saving right now and start whittling down your consumer debt, especially your credit card debt right now, because that's going to determine whether you get a good rate or not or whether you get a rate at all, whether you get a mortgage at all. And that That is so important, Marie. That credit card debt, you don't want to go out and start opening up new credit cards uh, while you're shopping for a mortgage. Preferably, you don't want to take out a new car loan or a used car loan while you're shopping for a mortgage. You want to get that in place. You want to look at your annual credit report. Uh, make sure nobody's been using your ID to open up uh, credit cards in your name. Uh, get that stuff all done. 
All right, so much to worry about, especially this next question that's coming up. One more question about a subject a lot of people are terrified to talk about, but it is a growing problem in many households. I'm talking about student debt and student loans. Take a look. Here's Laura. I just graduated college, and I have a ton of student loans to pay off, but I still want to start saving for my future. How do I balance saving money but also paying off my student debt? It's a tough question. Student loan and student debt seem impossible to pay off. So, Susan, how can graduates pay off that student debt and still set money aside for their future? Well, the first thing you've got to do is figure out how much you owe. I mean, that sounds kind of silly, but more experts that I've talked to said sometimes there are loans that fall through the cracks that you don't even remember taking out such a loan. Uh, so one way to get everything into place is to talk to the financial aid office. Um, there's a national student loan data system for federal loans. You should go on that national student loan data system online and figure out what loans you actually have. And then set up, you know, how much do I owe, what are the rates, when are things due. Um, and then get on an automatic payment plan. Many, uh, many uh, lenders will offer this and they will knock down a few point, uh, a little bit, you know, a little bit of break, not a big break, but they'll give you a little bit of break for setting up for auto, auto debit. And that's worth it because you're not going to miss a payment. So you've got to get that in place because you do need to pay those loans. And then you want to set some things aside. But if you've got a lot of credit card debt, I would suggest getting rid of that first. That's your first uh, mission. Uh, before saving, you know, you need, you need an emergency fund, six months, cover some expenses, but you also need to get rid of high cost credit card debt. High cost credit card debt and student loans coming together and it's not a good situation <laughs> yeah. in so many households. Some people, statistics tell us, are taking 20 years or longer to pay off their student loans. There are some people who in their 60s still have not paid them off and they're finding with their federal student loans from back in the 60s that their social security is being garnished. They're not getting the full check because the feds are saying, hey, you owe those student loans from back there, we're going to take it out of your social security from so many years ago. Exactly, and a lot of parents will take out more uh, student loans, for a plus loan for their kids. So they're still paying their loans, somebody else's loans. It's, it can be a vicious cycle. Wow. So many things to talk about. Susan Tompler, Detroit Free Press, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Murray. Great information for our viewers. All right, the keys to saving, they're really within your reach. And once you have them, you open the door to a wealth of opportunities for the future. We're going to discuss more of this in just a moment. Here's an easy money tip. Debt doesn't just go away unless you do something about it. Specifically, pay it off. And really, the best way is to cut back in other areas. Eat out less often. Take your lunch to work instead of buying it. Wear those clothes a little bit longer. Maybe don't buy tickets to the ball game or the movie. Check out that book at the library instead of buying it on Amazon. Yes, online shopping. If you can't stop clicking that submit button, you need to cut back on your internet exposure. Get into the habit of paying for more of those wants with cash instead of credit. It can be a lot harder to buy something when you see your money actually leave your pocket. It's also harder to buy with credit cards when you have only one card. Don't get into the habit of maxing out one card and then moving on to the next. Consider this a warning sign. If you can't pay off your credit card balance in full every month, you need to cut back because a credit card balance, thanks to the monthly interest payment, will only get bigger and bigger. And the next thing you know, you have an unpaid balance that's almost as big as a student loan. Retirement. Whether you're 20 years away from it or just two, it can seem intimidating. Of course, you want to have time to do all of the things that you dreamed of without having to worry about work. But to make that happen, you need to start your retirement saving strategy today. I'm joined by Noel Villawan, a certified financial planner with a passion for helping others navigate finances. Noel, thanks so much for being with us today. Murray, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, let's get to a question right now from a young man who really isn't sure of his options when it comes to saving for retirement. Let's take a look and see if we can help him supply an answer. Hi, as an entrepreneur, I wanted to know, since we don't have conventional 401ks, what options might we have for retirement when we're 65? All right, I give him a lot of credit because he's an entrepreneur who's really thinking about a retirement plan. So many entrepreneurs don't. They think they don't need one because they're just going to sell their business one day and live happily ever after. But eight out of 10 entrepreneurs don't make it, statistics tell us. And who knows when you're 65 if you're going to be able to sell your business and make any money on it. Absolutely. Um, Murray, I think what's interesting about that is, you know, when as a planner, we think about investing and putting money in the market and things of that nature. Timing is something that a lot of folks wish they had the ability to do on a consistent basis. So I think 
your, your point about selling out at the right time, it may or may not work out. So it's always good to have some contingencies in place to take care of that in case things aren't as lined up as, as well as they want to be. All right, I want to ask you about what contingencies there might be out there. And as we do that, I also want to mention to everybody that there are so many people in the so-called gig economy today. There are people who are working freelance. There are people who are working part-time. There are people all over the place who don't have coverage of a 401k. Talk to them. Sure. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting to take a step back and look at what makes a traditional 401k so appealing to so many folks. I mean, that's typical. That can actually be a big driver as to whether or not someone chooses to go to a particular employer or not. You know, one of the best things about a 401k is it's an easy way to save. You can set it up in a manner where you don't even have to think about it. That's a great aspect of the 401k. That's something that, and I think an entrepreneur would absolutely love this t type of a thing, is that you can re recreate that. There are other investment vehicles out there uh, that you can save. You can have some tax deferred benefit from that. Um, you can keep it as simple as a traditional IRA. It's been along for a while. You still have the ability to put money away in that whenever you have any kind of earned income. Uh, you can even set it up in a manner where you set up a direct deposit into it. You could easily connect your bank to your IRA account and make contributions almost in the exact same way that you would with that traditional 401k. Now, depending upon the situation for that individual, there's other options in addition to the 401k, excuse me, to the IRA. You could look at something like a SEP IRA or even a self-employed 401k. The benefit of those two vehicles is the ability to save even more. So depending upon the situation of that person uh, will dictate which one they can take advantage of. And so it turns out that there are really a lot of options out there for people who don't have an employer-backed retirement plan. That's the good part, and now you know where to start looking. Let's take a look at another question right now and see if we could solve it for Olette. Is it a good idea to pay off my mortgage before I retire? Simple, short, sweet. And very important, 44% of retirees are paying on a mortgage right now. What do you tell Olette and what do you tell them? Is it a good idea to pay it off before you retire? The short answer to that question I would say is yes. If it's, if it's possible to do that, you should make every effort to do so. And the reason for that is when you're making that transition from working, from having that regular steady paycheck coming in to retirement, now you have to look at your retirement assets pension if you have it, social security if you have it, and those are, that's your new job in terms of where your income's coming from. If you're in a position where you no longer have to commit a portion of that income to that mortgage anymore, now you've freed up some cash flow on a month-to-month -month basis, and that leads to other things that you could easily do. Go on that trip that you've always dreamed about save up enough and get maybe that dream motorcycle that you've always been thinking about. So it's just a matter of easing the pressure once you're in retirement. That's the best thing you'd get out of being able to pay that mortgage off before you retire. But the good part is that you're thinking about it before you retire, and that's what a lot of people have not done. So thanks for the insight there, Noel, on that one. Another question now from Colleen, who is wondering about her retirement strategy. So I'm not really that close to retirement, but I'm definitely closer than I was when I first started my career. So I'm wondering now, how do I know when it's time to adjust my retirement savings strategy? All right, is it just a plan that you put in place and let stay there, or does it need adjusting? That's a good question. I think a lot of people are starting to put money aside for retirement and never change the amount or the frequency that they contribute to their retirement plan or their retirement funds. It's, it's really a work in progress and should be, shouldn't it? Absolutely. And it's, it's somewhere in between in terms of do I just start it and forget it or do I look at it all the time? It's definitely somewhere in between there. Getting it started is, is really the first step. When folks are just getting started, it's important to get it going and just allow it to grow and grow and grow. Now, that being said, when you've been in it for a while, it is important to look at it from time to time. Not necessarily to tinker with it all the time and figure out where else is there, there's a better opportunity. It's more about making sure the degree of risk that you're comfortable with matches what you actually have invested. Because if you're in a situation where it's riskier than you're comfortable with, that could lead to an error. So one of the things is at least probably checking on it on an annual basis is a really good idea. The closer you get to retirement, maybe increase the frequency. Um, as far as changing things, again, a lot of that has to do with 
I think, the ability to maintain a presence in the market over the long term because that's when you win. If you're in a position where you might be second guessing yourself and the ability to stay that way, that's when it's time to have a sit down and, and take a look at things. Which is all not to say that when the market drops hundreds of points in a given day because of something that happened overseas while we were asleep, you don't necessarily have to change that retirement plan. Absolutely correct. And as a matter of fact, when you're checking on your portfolio prior to those things happening, you're in a position where when it does eventually those things events happen, it'll be just a matter of, well, it's not the greatest day in, uh, for me to, to see that. However, I'm aligned in a way that it's going to be all right over the long haul. All right. Got time for one more question? Sure. All right. Let's bring in somebody else. Uh, one more question now from a mother of two, Amanda. Let's see if we can help her out today. Hi, my husband and I have student loan debt and a mortgage. We also have two young children. I'm staying at home right now, but I'm planning on going back to work in a couple of years. How can we best save for retirement and the kids post high school education? Wow, it seems like Amanda has a lot on her plate. So many people can probably relate to that the struggle and how do you save for retirement when you're struggling and trying to balance owning a home at the same time and then the kids and then, as we talked about before, the student debt and it all comes together. Advice, sir. You know, Amanda's just certainly not, uh, she's not alone. There's a lot of folks dealing with that. And this is where planning, um, having a strategy in place can really make a difference. I always like to think of money and finances almost like herding cats. You got to keep an eye on it or else something's going to wiggle out there. Now, specific to having to figure out a strategy when it comes to dealing with debt, with saving and, and saving for retirement and things of that nature, look at it from a, from a big picture standpoint. Uh, sometimes we always say you want you value holistic financial planning. Well, what that means is if you look at paying off your debt as a part of your overall investment strategy, I think that can lead to a better long-term mentality in terms of, okay, I'm going to address my debt first, and especially when it comes to that high-interest credit card type of debt. Um, doing something, we call it a debt snowball, something where you are one at a time, you're knocking out all your debts. Once you do that, all of a sudden you're creating cash flow that now you can transfer to saving for kids' education for your retirement. So again, when you progressively move from one phase to the next, taking care of your debt, starting to save, and then starting to put away for your retirement, now you're in a really good long-term path. So I hear people out there saying, taking care of your debt, but I need money to pay off that debt. I know so many people, especially at your firm, have said, look at your uh, tax return. Look at the refund that you're getting. And for so many people, that might be enough to take care of that debt. Absolutely, and that's a, that's a really great point, um, Mary, because when folks show us r returns and you see those really huge returns, you know, they, they're very happy about seeing such a big amount of money coming back to them, but you got to take a step back and, and think about that. Okay, that's great, you got a nice check coming to you. However, over the past year, what was going on with that money? Something else that wasn't benefiting you in particular you can easily turn that situation around where it's working towards you as opposed to someone else. And that's the way so many people do get out of debt. Noel Villawan, thank you so much for being with us today and for your expert advice. My pleasure. All right, so now you know you're in the habit of saving. Great, right? You build a solid foundation for your retirement. So what's next? Coming up, we'll show you how to take that easy money that you saved and make it really pay off in the years to come. Here's an easy money tip. In recent years, and especially this year, conversations about Social Security have been about whether it will be around when you're ready to collect it. This year, for the first time since 1982, the Social Security system paid out more in benefits than it took in from workers' paychecks. And it's projected that by the year 2034, the Social Security Trust Fund could be gone. That doesn't mean Social Security will be gone. Workers will still be paying into the system so that retirees can still receive monthly payments. But unless our leaders in Washington take steps to fix the system, those payments could be cut by 20% or more. All the more reason that you need to establish other sources of money in retirement, like 401ks and IRAs. Another thing about Social Security, you can start collecting it at age 62, but you may not want to. You see, the longer you wait to start taking Social Security, the larger that monthly check will be. Every year you delay taking Social Security will raise your benefits by 8% until you reach age 70. So delayed gratification really pays off. 
Social Security can be the foundation of a reliable retirement income stream, but for that to happen tomorrow, you need to think about a plan today. The Social Security website has resources to make that easier. You also can enlist the services of a financial planner. You now have the tools you need to save money, but once you do, where do you put that money? You could put it into a savings account where it would be safe, safe, but not growing quickly enough to keep up with inflation, and certainly not as fast as it would grow if you used the money to buy stocks. Investing is risky, but it can also be rewarding. I'm joined right now by Ryan C. Mack, a financial planner and advocate who is determined to educate people of all ages on the power of financial literacy. Ryan, you have educated many people who yeah. have a lot of money, and you also enjoy working with people who have very little. Absolutely. Really starting to build their financial literacy, right. especially in the inner city. Well, b bottom line is whether you're uh, uh, retiring from Goldman Sachs or you're coming out of prison, we're all living in the community together. And these are the principles in terms of what you're talking about this show or what we have to learn in the community every single day. We have to get these principles under our belt if we're going to have a sustainable growth that helps everybody. Sustainable growth, good for the economy, right. but it's got to be good for the people too or else they exactly. can't participate in the economy. Right. So even though the basics of investing, Ryan, can be scary and overwhelming for many people, let's hear from Tom right now mm -hmm. who has absolutely no idea as to where he's going to start. I'm 62. I've never invested and I'm a little worried about it. How can I begin at this age? How can I begin at the age of 62? Well, I, I gotta say, Tom, better late than later. And uh, I think it's time for time to do a, a gut check. And when I say doing a gut check, you know, there are three different stages of investment. You know, you have the accumulation stage, you have the conservation stage, and then you have the distribution stage. So, and the gut check to me means, how would you feel if you had 100% of your money invested in stocks and the entire stock market just crapped out right away? If you're 25 in the accumulation stage, you might actually be happy because you can buy stocks cheaper. But if you're in the conservation stage, maybe 43 years old, you might be a little bit more concerned, but you, you, you're just starting to think about retirement for the first time. So you, you know what, I, I lost all my money here, but I have a little bit more time to recover. But if you're 62 and you don't have hardly any of time, I mean, Tom right now is 62 years old. He's in a distribution stage where he's supposed to be thinking about taking money out. So hopefully he didn't consider the 401k to 450, 403b. Many individuals don't consider that investing. They just say, well, if I'm putting money in, in, in buying individual stocks, I'm not really investing in my 401k, but that really is investing. So hopefully he does have something to back up on. But if he doesn't, he has to start thinking about all the different options. So here are the different things that we can think about. So at 62, if he starts taking Social Security right now, he's taking about a 30% hit right off the top in terms of benefits. So does he really want to do that? Here are things that Tom needs to start looking at right now that any financial planner will make you look at. The first thing is looking at your life expectancy. You know, and that's a very challenging question. How long do you, do you think you're going to live? I mean, I know my father is 75 years old, takes nothing but vitamins, but my stepfather is 75 years old. He takes a lot of things, battling over cancer. So many individuals have different health things. So second thing is, what is your level of health? And what, are you taking a lot of pills? Are you, are you going to the doctor regularly? I ask Tom, how do you feel every single day, Tom? And then the, another thing is making sure what's your marital uh, status? Are you married? Are you single? Then lastly, most importantly, what different income sources do you have? I mean, do you have a 401k? Do you have savings? Do you have different things that you can tap into and pull money out of? All those things we have to start putting the money together and figure out exactly how he's going to make the next step for that truly investment step to make sure he can have a successful retirement. All right, so he has basically, if he has not retired, uh, if he has not uh, invested, he's lost right. 30 years of growth and right. he may have 30 more years to live. Yeah. Uh, more than half of retirees, we are told, right. actually go back to work and do something because they need right. it. They need the money and they also need the companionship, but they need the money too. Yeah, I call that spending your golden years working for the golden arches. I mean, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you see individuals working for McDonald's not because they necessarily want to, because they have to. I used to know a good friend of mine named Gus. Gus, I saw him every single day in Brooklyn. He was always sitting out on the porch. And I was thinking, I said, Gus, you love playing checkers. Well, Gus said, you know what, Ryan, I really love it, but I have to do it because I'm pretty much, I'm strapped at home. I don't have enough money to afford to go anywhere else because all my money is going in my expenses. So, I mean, that's the, the importance of this show. This show is important because people like Gus, when they get to those age, hopefully people that are 25 are watching this show so they don't have to be like individuals like Gus so they can have the money to have their freedom because Gus couldn't do anything but just go to the park and do anything that are free. We want to make sure they're spending their golden years being retired in a comfortable way. 
even when you're retired, if yeah. you can find the money to invest, right. it's not going to hurt. Exactly. I mean, absolutely. I mean, Investing. But just making sure you're having the right asset allocation. Again, you, if you, you have to have some level of exposure to investments like stocks, but not as much as if you were 25. So definitely, but definitely more on the fixed income side, if anything else. All right. Let's go back into the household right now and hear from a family of three. And they're looking to make a big investment. We are looking to buy a new home. We have the funds for the down payment. And when we sell our current home, we'd like to know what to invest that money in, um, all while trying to go from working full time to a stay at home mom and um, living off of one income, save for his college and our retirement. A lot of things to think about right yeah. there. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is it good for Mark and Andy to invest the money uh, that they're getting from selling their home? And where should they invest it if the answer is yes? Have you ever heard of money heaven? Money heaven. Money heaven are those things that when you spend your money on a lot of different things, but if you put your money in money heaven, you never see your money ever again. So there's four things in money heaven that I really want this couple to really just take a good look at. First of all, your debt your living expenses, uh, your taxes, and irresponsible giving. So that, that's really making a holistic picture before we even start thinking about investments. So let's look at your debt, right? If you can't afford to pay your bills, stop making bills. So a lot of individuals, especially if they have a little bit of money, so it seems like they have some high class problems, right? So they have a little bit of money on the side, they've sold their house, where now they might say, you know, why do we have to, well, let's go ahead and just take this trip. Let's start racking up more debt because we start, as individuals, tendency is they start making more money, they start spending more money. So let's not do that. I've worked with a lot of doctors over the years, individuals making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, but they're so debt ridden that they can't even afford themselves because they have so much debt. So let's start making sure that we can minimize the debt. Let's look at your living expenses. Just because you're making a little bit more money, you have some, a nest egg, how about making a bigger nest egg? Let's make sure you're putting together a budget seeing exactly how much you're spending on a week-to-week -week basis, month-to-month -month basis, year-to-year -year basis, it's working with your couple. I mean, when you're, when you're married, that's the perfect time that you can start using one another to have that self and checks and, and balance is in the household and making sure that you all have your individual goals are being met as well as your couple goals are being met. And then let's look at minimizing your taxes. I mean, less than 5% of individuals actually took advantage of the 529 college savings plan. The 529 plan is one of the best plans to actually minimize your taxes because you get a double hit, a double positive hit. It. You get to save money going in. Let's say they're making a hundred grand a year. They put up to maximum five thousand dollars. Most states have a five thousand maximum. The various five to nine college savings plans. So they're only taxed on ninety five thousand. They've saved on average maybe about twelve hundred fifty bucks on taxes. So now they get to save money going in. When they pull money coming out, as long as they put that money towards college expenses, they get that money tax free. So that's one of the most positive things you can do. And then lastly, irresponsible giving. I don't know about your family, Murray, but I know a lot of folks in my family, as soon as you start making a little bit of money, you got a lot of folks saying, hey, let me borrow a little of this, let me borrow a little of that. Let's figure out, hey, you know what? Let's not do irresponsible giving. Let's make sure we can give with a purpose, promissory notes, all those types of things and making sure individuals pay back. I've done a lot of giving to individuals in my family to say, hey, if you give me a, an application for your GED, then I'll make sure I can give you that loan. But you have to make sure you put something on the table first before I let you borrow some money. So all those things, and then start looking at questions like, have I maxed out your 401k or 403b or 457, whichever they have one? Do you have an emergency fund, nine to 12 months of living expenses, six months cash, three to six months of, 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 of uh, and credit, and other things to make sure you start building up a, st a stable foundation. All right, so they have so much to think about, yeah. but, but they have a direction right now. It's a good direction. Yeah. And it's great advice. It's high class problems. High class problems, nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's good that you have them. Yeah. All right, we have one more question. It's from a young woman named Rana. Let's take a listen to her. What would be the best thing to invest in to make sure I have a comfortable retirement? Seems like a basic question, but right. it's something that people worry about. Uh, I don't think we're talking about one investment right. to make sure you have a good, we're talking about plural investments, right? right? Well, there, there are so many different options out there, stocks, bonds, business, real estate, commodities, all, derivative, all different types of things. But when you're in, it all, again, it all depends on your life cycle. If you're already in that distribution phase, you might want to start thinking about high yield securities like real estate investment trusts or dividend paying stocks where you might have exposure to the stock market, but they're paying you a good dividend. So if the stock actually falls a little bit, you're still getting a good income from it. 
I love municipal bonds in the retirement stage where you're getting a tax exempt yield uh, of those individuals, especially now where the Fed just uh, cut rates or uh, uh, in, they're increasing rates again. So we're in an increasing interest rate environment. So now interest rates are going to start gradually going up. So municipal bonds and corporate bonds are going to start being a little bit more favorable for securities like CDs or other savings type yields. And other difference, uh, Treasury infl inflation protected securities to make sure you can check inflation for, uh, for inflation. There's a ton of different things out there. You just make sure that you know your why. What is your why when you're talking about investing? Are you investing for your, your house? Are you investing for retirement? Are you investing for your children's future or in terms of their college? What is your why and what is your timeline? A lot of individuals now, we have all the all different types of crazes going on. Everybody's talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and all different types of things and all this. it's almost like the new hottest thing right so if you talk to a real estate agent the best investment will be a, a house if you talk to a stockbroker the best investment will be your stocks if you talk to a commodities trader the best investment will be in oil all those could be good investments we want to make sure you have a good diverse investment that depends on your, your on your investment style on your investment strategy give yourself a good gut check and making sure you're doing the best that, that fits your financial goals and strategy you just touched on something with a simple three-letter word your why yeah. why why are you doing this another word what are your goals mm -hmm. and you named all the goals that a typical family might have they want right. to buy a house they want to buy a car they want to send the kids to school they want to go to school themselves they want to pay off some debt and all of those things all of that comes into the plan correct right. me if I'm wrong, about what you need, where you need it, because now you know where you want to go. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, 93% of this country is unable to support themselves after the age of 63 without uh, Social Security or family support. That's over 9 out of 10 individuals have not talked about the things that we're talking about on this show right now. So if we can start having these conversations, I hope that not only individuals who are 65 watch the show, individuals who are 25 are watching the show, individuals who are 15 are watching the show, so they can start getting their mindset together. I hope that people to start pulling their family together and start having conversations, real conversations about budgeting and strategies and letting them see this is how much this house costs, this is our retirement plan, this is your 529 plan. These are the type of things we have to start as soon as possible. Ryan C. Mack, I can't thank you enough for being with us and for your valuable advice today. Thank you so much. So there you have it, making your paycheck work for you not only today but also tomorrow. It's easier than you think when you think about it, using the tools that we've given you today to overcome the confusion and become confident in your finances. You'll feel prepared when you get to turn 65 years old. It may not be obvious, but it can be easy with the right advice. And there's more that you can do to learn about personal finance. We have more to share about spending, about saving, about investing, and more topics to help you make the most of your money. Visit our website, wi65.org. We're also sociable. Follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at wi65project. And then tell us what you think, or maybe give us a piece of your mind. But most importantly, ask us your questions, and we'll look for the answers. Until next time, I'm Murray Feldman. Thanks for watching When I'm 65, Easy Money.